So we've talked about naming stars, which is one thing that is not astronomy and I hate to talk about, but feel like I have to. <laughs> and now there's something I hate talking about even more. Again, I feel we have to, which is... Well, I think you hate it just because of how little it makes sense as well. Yes, which is the way the magnitude scale for measuring the brightness of stars. And this is an abomination and should have been burnt and destroyed decades ago or centuries ago. But astronomy, even if it's wrong, it's tradition, so we love to keep it. So what's so bad about the magnitude system? Okay, so we want to work out how bright a star is and have yeah. some common way to say, um, it's about such and such a brightness. Yeah. Now the sensible way to do it nowadays, with now we have devices like photo, um, photometers that can measure precisely how much bright, would be to say, the amount of radiation we receive from it, yep. or, the, um, or the luminosity, how bright it really is. But for most of history, we didn't have those things. So it was yep. more or less eyeball, and say, oh, that one looks brighter than that one. And we have, to have ancient Greeks to thank for this. They have up with the magnitude scale. And basically, they said that the brighter stars would be first magnitude, it'd be like the upper class. And the stars that were about half as bright would be second magnitude working middle class, I guess, and then you get the third magnitude stars, which are about half as bright again, and all the way down to about fifth magnitude, which is the very faintest things you can see. So they're the peasants of this solar system, or this, the space. Yes. So this went on for a long time, and it kind of made sense. So if someone, someone tells you this is a first magnitude star, you know it's going to be That's pretty right. bright. And if you say it's a fifth magnitude star, it's going to be if that, yeah. Yes. So uh, it made sense. But when people actually developed um, photometers that could precisely measure the brightness that actually qualify, quantify it a bit. Yep. And the decision was made to more or less stick with this. They would use Vega as their reference point. I don't know why they chose Vega rather than the brightest on the sky, which is actually Sirius. Sirius yeah. Vega is one of third or fourth brightest or something like that in the sky. Um, I guess it's up in the Northern Hemisphere, so Northern Hemisphere astronomers can see it most of the time, so maybe it was convenient. And they called that magnitude zero. And everything that's fainter than it is, and they chose that if it gets five magnitudes fainter, it's called, um, it's a hundred times less radiation you're picking up from it. So, okay, so we now have Vega is zero. And if something's a hundred times less radiation coming from it than Vega, it'd be fifth magnitude. Okay. And, and a, it's a logarithmic scale. And so a one is less than zero in this scheme, even though it's not, but let's ignore that mathematical yep. fact. So basically every, every magnitude is a factor of the fifth root of 100, which is 2.5112, fainter. So basically if a star is magnitude one, it's 2.5112 times fainter than Vega. And then, if it's uh, magnitude two, yep. it's 2.511 squared fainter than Vega. If it's third magnitude, it's 2.511 cubed, yep. which is yes. 10 times or something like this. So the magnitude scale, first of all, it's based on 2.5 by one one two, and it goes backwards because the higher the number, the fainter it is. So yeah, oh wait, wait, wait. okay, yeah. So wait, wait, what if happens if something's brighter than Vega though? Well, then it has to get a negative number. So, for example, Sirius is magnitude minus one and a half. Obviously. And there aren't very many things brighter than Vega. Yeah. Sirius is one of the few stars that's brighter. Uh, but also things like the moon and the planets could well be brighter than... That's right. And so they will have minus magnitudes. So you... The, and then it still works the other way. There are 2.51 times brighter than Vega. So the magnitude minus one would be 2.511 times brighter. Sirius at 1.6 is therefore going to be you know, three or four times yeah. brighter than Vega. So that's, we've got a scale that goes backwards, that's logarithmic, where the zero point is not the brightest star in the sky. I mean, what's, what's not to love about this? <laughs> so why do we use this? Well, it's, it's worse than that. I mean, we haven't even, the, the complexity, I mean, this is pretty bad already. Yep. Um, to make it even worse, it depends, uh, well, the legend limits, first of all. So okay, okay. Human, I guess the reason we do this is because it's very familiar. That astronomers have been doing this for yeah. hundreds of years, and so every astronomer, it's built into our brains. That's right. And so if I tell you I want to look at a supernova that's 15th magnitude, you will immediately know right away what sort of telescope we're going to need, what sort of exposure that's time. True. Whereas if I told you at a flux of 3 by 10 to the minus 16 ergs per centimeter squared per second per angstrom, you might have a bit more trouble working that out. So it has that benefit of reducing the scale, as we said in some times, right? If I say this star is 10 to the 38 kilograms, uh, what does that mean? If I say it's two times the mass of our sun? Okay, I kind of know the size. So yeah. it's 
Relatable. All right, I can see that. That being said, the radio astronomers never had the stupid baggage because they all were physicists, and they came up with a much more sensible scale to measure things in Jansky. So this would be a Jansky or a milli Jansky or a micro Jansky. Yep. And uh, optical astronomers would be far better off getting rid of magnitudes and using some sensible unit like that. I think you're fighting, uh, fighting an uphill battle here, but you know. Yeah, but I mean, we do know these magnitude scales. So normally, brighter stars are yeah. about zero, one, maybe minus one. The faintest you can see is about fifth magnitude with the naked eye. It depends and, and on how dark, dark it is. Yeah, yeah, if no, you go to a city, it might only be third magnitude. If it's yeah. really dark and you've taken the time to let your eyes dark adjust, you might be able to see five and a half or maybe yeah. even six. With a pair of binoculars, a good pair of binoculars, you may be able to see down to seven or eight. Yeah. Amateur telescope, maybe 12th, 13th magnitude. Um, the main thing we've ever seen is the Hubble Space Telescope, yep. which spent an exceedingly large amount of time staring at the ultra deep field, one particular part of the sky, yep. hundreds of hours staring at this, and the faintest things here are 29th magnitude. So, you know, the, these little faint fuzzy dots are 29th magnitude. So, it's 2.5 essentially to the power 29 times fainter, fainter than Vega. Yes. So if you think of every five magnitudes is a factor of 100, it's about 30th magnitude, so it's 106 times. Yep. So that's uh, 10 to the 12. That's right. About a trillion, trillion times, times fainter than Vegas, which is actually pretty impressive. I mean, in most fields of human endeavor, we have machines that do better than we do. Yeah. So we have planes that can go faster than humans, and they can fly, which humans generally can't do. <laughs> or, or we've got diggers that can lift heavier weights. But in most of those cases, like a really big machine might be able to lift a thousand times more than a human. That's right. But well, the Hubble Space Telescope can see a trillion, trillion times fainter than humans, which is very impressive. It is, yeah, yeah. And obviously, the, it sees a range of brightnesses in between, and I guess that's the benefit, we'll say, is you can already say, all right, well, we know that's brighter than that, and this is brighter or fainter than that. So you can put the scale immediately to one picture or part of the sky of what is brighter and potentially more energetic or not, but there's other issues if we talked about. Now, there's one complexity with these magnitudes, which is that it's going to depend on what wavelength you look at. Yeah. So we... The original scale was based on the human eye, but even different people's human eyes are different sensitivity right. at different wavelengths. That's right. So what's the bright magnitude to you might be looking different for magnitude to me. And then when you're observing with a telescope, different telescopes, um, as we talked about back yep. in uh, spectroscopy, have different sensitivities at different wavelengths. That's right. We normally observe through a filter. These are different filters of our colleague Mike down there. And they will let in a certain let's set of wavelengths. And the magnitude is going to depend on what wavelengths you observe at. Yeah, because we talked about stars and, you know, there's blue stars and red stars and they have different er energies or brightnesses in these different colors, right? Yep. So, for example, here's uh, our own SkyMapper telescope. And this has this set of filters. There's uh, uh, different filters at different wavelengths. U for ultraviolet, V is still ultraviolet, actually. Yeah. G for sort of blue plus green and red. red and for, infrared. Yeah, infrared and Z, Z for... Z because we don't have letters, yeah. so we gave it something like that. But we're really, so, you know, we're really starting to just see out of the edge our eyes can. Yep, so, but let's imagine we look at different spectra of stars. I think we've okay. seen this before. Yep. Let's say we're observing with a filter at a wavelength of down around 4,400 uh, nanometers. This is a... An O, a blue, blue giant star. One of those big, black, young ones. And uh, look at this one, it's going to be very bright. This is a G type star like our sun, and this is a, a right. red giant or a red dwarf, an M type star. So, so the brightness between the, the, the G type and the red uh, giant or dwarf, not that much, but pretty dramatic to the blue. Yeah, but if you had a wavelength around here, you can see this is a sort of five times. Yeah. So that'd be about two, two magnitudes, magnitudes brighter. So if this is magnitude zero, this would be magnitude two. two. But this is going to be what? five times more, so this would be magnitude minus two. Okay. If you go and observe about here, they're all about the, the same, same. Yep. so they all have the same magnitude. If you go out here, then the red star is going to look much brighter, so it's going to have a negative magnitude, whereas the blue star is going to be fainter. Well, I guess you could even go further, right? If your, your filter band's even narrower, if you're managed here versus just slightly over different, it's going to be a dramatically different brightness. Absolutely. So what it means is that it's not enough to say what the magnitude of a star is. You have to say a magnitude In with what, what filter. So you have to say how bright it is in G, 
or how bright it is in the ultraviolet or the blue. And this turns into enormous can of worms because your G filter might not be quite the same as my G filter. And even if it was the same, it's probably on a different telescope with a different detector, and the detector's always going to change the sensitivity. And a different atmosphere right above it that's There's a bit changes. of dust blowing over yeah. that might absorb the red side of these things. And so this is. And if you're near the ocean, there's different layers of water vapor, which affects the infrared light differently. There's all sorts of issues. And we've all spent far too much of our life worrying about these issues. Uh, it's a very, very major thing that astronomers spend all their time about. Yes. See, the astronomer would never say this is you know, 20 second magnitude. They'll say it's 20 second magnitude in the Sloan G filter um, after a correction for extinction or something like this. And even then, we won't be that accurate about it because we're exactly. sure the correction won't be precise. You've also got a factor in the dust in our galaxy. Looking yep. at something outside the galaxy, the dust in our galaxy will change its brightness. And then the dust varies as a position of the galaxy. So where you look over there will be different than, say, where you look outside the plane. This is where I point, stop, point I start crying on your shoulder and you start crying on mine because this is what we spend far too much of our lives doing. Uh, if only it wasn't true. <laughs> Uh, however, this is, uh, finally allows us to understand the scale on the bottom of this diagram. We've yep. seen this diagram before, and we've talked about the temperatures, and we've seen the scale went backwards. That's right. The reason it went backwards is actually what you measure is a magnitude difference between two filters. This has been observed in the BP filter, which is a blue Gaia-specific filter, yeah. and an RP filter, which is a red Gaia-specific filter. So it's taking one of those bluer filters on the left and red filters and subtracting the difference between the two. Yes, so a particular star might have magnitude 10 in the B filter and 12 in the red filter. Yeah. So B minus R would be minus 2, which we put it over here, which means it's actually very blue. So if it's 2 and 4, it would still be minus 2. Yes. So this is telling us the color of something. Okay. And so vast numbers of astronomical diagrams have axes which are we usually, by convention, have the shorter wavelength filter yeah. first and subtract off the longer wavelength filter. And the way it works is, let's say it was Vega, then by definition it would have zero for both, so yep. a colour of about zero. But let's imagine it was brighter at red wavelengths. Like Betelgeuse? Yes. Uh, let's say that the same magnitude as in the optical as Vega, but was brighter in the red. Because it's brighter in the red, the, um, the red magnitude is going to become larger. Smaller. S smaller, which is larger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this so, is why you hate it. <laughs> yeah, yes. So it's brighter, therefore its magnitude is larger. So that means if you do B minus R, that's now going to be negative. That's right. That's going to be positive, sorry. Positive, yeah. yeah. So yes. this number is going to actually be lower, even though it's bigger. And this is why we say it's a bad system. <laughs> yes. But enough to remember that a large number means it's red. Yep. <laughs> a small number means it's blue. And don't worry about trying to get your brain around that. See, it's stronger in a red wavelength. Therefore, the magnitude is going to be... Uh, yeah. uh, my, my yeah, brain is dribbling out of my ears. We're really taking those ratios, right? We're essentially saying, let's take a ratio in this part of the spectrum and this part of the spectrum, and what does it look like? And if we go back to that plot where we saw the, the G and the B and the O stars, that kind of would actually work well because they have different shapes, and that tells us a little bit about the different structure, the different yeah. color, which we know is temperature. Now, if you're going to be a professional optical astronomer, this is something you'll need to worry about. But I would wait until you start doing your PhD before worrying about it too much. Yeah. For anybody else, I wouldn't care about it. It's a horrible, it's just so that when you see these strange units used by someone, you know what it is and can avoid it and run a mile. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs>